Welcome to this video on rotational transitions in molecules. This video is part of our ongoing series of trying to understand how radiation interacts with matter, and in this case, particularly with molecules consisting of more than one atom. And in particular, it's surprising how far you can get in the modeling of molecules by treating them as rigid rotors. In the rigid rotor model of a molecule, Atoms are connected together by bonds that arise from the exchange of valence electrons. And although it's true that this molecular bond is not completely static, to a good first approximation, this molecular bond length is nearly fixed. And if you accept that this molecular bond length is fixed, then the method for calculating the quantized angular momentum states of these molecules is pretty straightforward. The first step you need to do is the same that we explored with the classical hydrogen atom, which is that we need to quantize angular momentum. And in the case of molecules, we will set the angular momentum to be in units of h bar counted by the variable j, where j denotes the total angular momentum in a molecule. And in practice, j can be the sum of the rotational angular momentum, the electronic angular momentum, and the spin angular momentum of any of its constituent atoms and particles. But unlike each of these constituent components of angular momentum, the total angular momentum of this molecule is conserved, which is why we're going to use it to characterize our angular momentum. Now, when I say conserved, I mean that without emitting or absorbing a photon, J will be a constant value for this molecule, even if the angular momentum is exchanged internally between the orbitals of the electrons that are going around the atoms, the actual rotation of the molecule itself, and the spins of the component particles in the atoms. Individually, L, N, and S, these component quantum numbers, are not necessarily conserved in a molecule. Only the total angular momentum is, which is why we will use J to characterize it, even though the types of transitions we're talking about, these rotational transitions, are focusing on the component of angular momentum that arises from the atoms spinning around each other. The next step in calculating rotational energy levels is to calculate the angular velocity of the rotation. So let's start with the definition of angular momentum. The angular momentum around a point classically is the sum of each component of mass at a radius of separation from the point in question crossed with the velocity of that point. And in our case, R is going to be from the center of mass. And I'm going to go ahead and choose the component of the velocity that's perpendicular to that R, V perpendicular, so that I can simplify the sum without the vector notation as simply the mass times the radius times the perpendicular velocity of each massive particle or atom in the molecule. Now, if we assume solid body rotation in this molecule, the rigid rotor model, then V perpendicular is equal to the distance of a point from the center of mass times the angular velocity of the rotation around that point, the center of mass, which means we can write our angular momentum as the sum of m r squared omega, where omega is the angular velocity of the rotation. And because the angular velocity of the rotation is not dependent on which particle we're talking about, we're assuming rigid rotation, we can factor it out of the sum here to say that angular momentum is the moment of inertia times omega, where I'll remind you that the moment of inertia is this sum of mass times radius squared. Next, we should calculate the energy of rotation. And in the case of a rigid rotor, the energy is simply the sum of the kinetic energy of each point as it's rotating, the 1 half mv squared for each point as it rotates around the center of mass. And using our definition of v perpendicular above as being r times omega, we can then rewrite this as 1 half the sum of mr squared times omega squared, which you'll recognize as 1 half moment of inertia times omega squared. And if we wanted to rewrite that in terms of the angular momentum that we wrote down here as I omega, we get that the energy is one over two times the moment of inertia times L squared, where by taking L squared, I get an I squared omega squared, but I need to divide one of those I's and a factor of two back out of it to get the energy, which is what I've done here. Now remember, we've quantized angular momentum to be in units of J times H bar. So if we plug that in for L down below, we'll find that E is equal to H bar squared over two times the moment of inertia times J squared. Now I wanna caution you that this equation is close 
but not quite right. The reason it's not quite right is because in detail, quantum mechanically, the energy operator that generates the various angular momentum states, which is the Laplace operator acting on the spherical harmonics in the algebraic group SO3, which is the space of rotations in three-dimensional space, actually has energy eigenstates of j times j plus one, not j squared. So this is just a small quantum mechanical detail in our semi-classical treatment of molecules as rigid rotors. But with this little fix, we can get the actual energy associated with the rotation of this molecule as h bar squared over two times the moment of inertia times j times j plus one. So this is great. This gives us the energy of a molecule in a particular quantized rotation state as being approximately proportional to j squared, although in detail it's j times j plus one times h bar squared over two times the moment of inertia. Now we know what j is, that's what's specified in our rotational state. We know what h bar is. What we need to do is to be able to calculate what is the moment of inertia, i, and then we can calculate what the actual energies are for actual molecules. Now to calculate the moment of inertia for a general molecule, you need to first find the center of mass of that molecule, and then find relative to that center of mass, the separation vector r times the mass at each point. And generally, you just have to do this. But for a two-atom molecule, a diatomic molecule, there's an algebraic shortcut, which is the reduced mass which is the product of the masses divided by the sum of the masses. And effectively what this is doing for two atoms of unequal weights separated by this bond length is it's finding the weighted average of their masses to find the center of mass and positioning this center of mass there as this linear average of the two weights such that we can then multiply the reduced mass by the total separation vector to get the moment of inertia so that in this particular special case of a diatomic molecule, the moment of inertia is equal to the reduced mass times the total separation of the atoms, r squared, where we've moved r now is no longer the distance from the center of mass, it's the total separation between the two atoms. So if you want to calculate a reduced mass, you can just plug in the masses of the different atoms in your, two, in your diatomic molecule. But the last thing that we need is what is the actual separation of these atoms? What is R? And a good rule of thumb is that the separation is approximately two Bohr radii, where I'll remind you that the Bohr radius, which we derived in the semi-classical hydrogen atom, is equal to h bar squared over e squared times the mass of an electron. Now you might question, why should it be exactly two Bohr radii between every atom in a molecule? And the answer is, it's not exactly two Bohr radii, but it's usually very close. And why should it be very close even when we're dealing with atoms that have much higher atomic numbers than hydrogen? And the answer is, if you have a higher atomic number, a higher number of nucleons, and in particular positive charges in your nucleus, then those electric charges pull harder on the electrons that are going around those atoms and pull them into orbits that are closer in. So as an atom gets bigger, it pulls its electrons closer and closer. But whenever you're adding the last electron onto that atom, most of the nuclear charge is shielded by all the electrons that are already in there. So for the very last electron that you're adding on to a neutral atom, that electron is feeling just one unit of electric charge in the nucleus pulling on that electron in effect. And the balance of orbital velocity associated with the ground level angular momentum state relative to a nuclear charge of one unit is precisely what the Bohr radius is. So for this reason, a Bohr radius is a pretty good estimate for the radius of nearly any atom. And when you have two atoms sitting close together, you have approximately two Bohr radii separating the nuclei of the two atoms. Now to remind you, a Bohr radius is approximately half an angstrom. So two Bohr radii so let's do an example. Let's do carbon monoxide, which is a diatomic molecule, carbon bound to oxygen. Carbon has 12 atomic mass units. That's six protons, six neutrons. And oxygen has 16 atomic mass units, eight protons, eight neutrons, which means that the reduced mass of carbon monoxide is equal to 
12 times 16 times the mass of a proton squared, where I'm ignoring the difference in mass between a proton and a neutron, and just assigning them both a proton's mass, which ends up with an answer of 48 sevenths times the proton mass. And if we call that approximately 7 times whatever a proton mass is, which is, we're going to just say roughly order of magnitude, 2 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, that means that the moment of inertia is roughly 7 times 2 times 10 to the 24 times the separation, which is 2 Bohr radii, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 squared, which comes out roughly to about 1 times 10 to the minus 39 grams times centimeters squared. Now remember, we're calculating this moment of inertia, I, so that we can plug it in here in the equation for the energy states of a carbon monoxide atom. And for this, we should talk about a specific transition. So let's try a J from 1 to 0 transition in carbon monoxide. So if we're talking of a J 1 to 0, the change in energy will be the energy of the J equals 1 state, which is h bar squared over 2i times j times j plus 1, which for 1 is 2, minus the energy in the j equals 0 state, which is j times j plus 1 for 0, which is 0. So this is equal to h bar squared over i, and this is roughly, in CGS units, 1 times 10 to the minus 27 erg seconds squared over 1 times 10 to the minus 39 gram centimeters squared, which comes out to be roughly 1 times 10 to the minus 15 ergs. Now, if you want to know what frequency that corresponds to, you can set that equal to h nu. And dividing out h, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 27, because remember the bar is divided by 2 pi here, you get a frequency of about 100 gigahertz, or 1 times 10 to the 11 hertz. Now, it turns out the true answer for the j equals 1 to 0 transition in carbon monoxide is a frequency of 115 gigahertz. So just by assuming very roughly a two Bohr radius separation of these atoms and quantizing angular momentum, we got the frequency of this transition to within 15 percent. Now the last thing I wanted to talk about is selection rules for rotational transitions. So for carbon monoxide we chose a J transition of 1 to 0, which is to say that we chose a delta J to be 1. And in fact, these transitions where j changes by 1, either in the positive or negative direction, are stronger transitions than many others. And they are stronger transitions because the quantum mechanic pathways for producing photons from these transitions are more straightforward. This happens because they can directly produce a photon. And to directly produce a photon, you need a dipole moment. These dipole moments which are in asymmetric molecules, are what give rise to Larmor radiation. And macroscopically, Larmor radiation is what's launching the photons. In quantum mechanics, there are multiple pathways to producing photons, but these dipole transitions are the ones that are producing the photons directly. And it's worth pointing out that symmetric molecules, like for example, molecular hydrogen, H2, only have quadrupole moments, and when you only have a quadrupole moment, you can't directly launch photons the way you can with a dipole moment in Larmor radiation. There's internal cancellation that needs to happen quantum mechanically, and this actually restricts us to changing angular momentum states by plus or minus two. But for dipole transitions, because you can directly produce a photon, delta J will change by one. And the reason it changes by one is because photons carry off a unit of angular momentum. Photons carry angular momentum. So by changing an angular momentum state by one, we're allowing our photon to be launched directly carrying some angular momentum. So selection rules are a way of kind of formalizing and keeping track of the different conservation rules and pathways that quantum mechanics has available for actually producing photons. So more generally, selection rules are ways of describing when transitions are strong uh, based on conserving the relevant quantum numbers. But there are kinds of transitions that don't obey these rules. If you violate these selection rules, which are for dipoles, you have what are called forbidden transitions, which is something of a misnomer because they aren't actually forbidden, they're just weak. They're weaker than the dipole transitions. Now, 
it's true that you also have to conserve certain quantum numbers no matter what. So forbidden transitions don't violate overall conservation of things like angular momentum or energy like that. All they do is they describe pathways that are more complex toward producing a photon. And often these more complex pathways involve simultaneously changing different states inside of the molecule, where you could, for example, go from a J equals zero to a J equals zero state. And that is in fact a transition that can happen. For example, it does happen in the 21 centimeter transition of hydrogen, but it's a very weak transition because it's forbidden. It's not a dipole transition and it doesn't obey the selection rules for dipole transitions. So that was the last piece that you need to know about rotational transitions, which is that there are selection rules about how we can translate between different angular momentum states in a molecule. But roughly, if you have an asymmetric molecule, you'll probably have a dipole moment. And if you have a dipole moment, your angular momentum is gonna change by units of one in a photon transition. Now, next time we're going to talk about vibrational states and it's worth mentioning before we do that rotation and vibrational states couple. So while we can describe rotational transitions by themselves just fine, and we do, more generically, we talk about rho vibrational transitions, which involve simultaneous transitions in rotation and the vibrational modes of molecules. So in some ways, even though this is a nicely encapsulated topic here as rotational transitions, the more generic topic that encompasses all molecular transitions are rho vibrational transitions, which we will talk about after we discuss the vibrational transitions by themselves.